Leaks to CG seminar number 241. And today our topic is academic boundaries and the impact agenda for academic research. And Elil Cohen is our presenter. I'll introduce him in a moment. Let me take you through the webinar protocols. Now remember that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CG website in due course. It uh, finds its way onto YouTube where it is uh, likely to be watched by more people than will connect today. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. Now, please keep yourself muted during the webinar unless you've been asked to speak or you're asking your question. Uh, and there's no need to have your video on during the webinar either, but please turn on both your audio and your video when you're asking a question. We recommend that you use the speaker view setting in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is talking. It's in that top right-hand corner of your Zoom screen. To ask a question, please develop your question or your statement for the Q&A section of the webinar in the chat function. Uh, write out the question or statement there, and then I'll be able to select you into the q and I'll send you a warning prior to asking you to come into the conversation in the Q&A. Um, now, uh, when you're invited to come into the Q&A, don't forget to unmute yourself, turn on your video if it's working for you and state your name and where you are from. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Elil Cohen, who's been an active participant in our webinar series. Um, many occasions um, with Pithy and uh, an interesting statements and questions in the discussion. He's a sociologist. He focuses on higher education. I think you did your doctorate at the University of Sheffield, Elil, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yes, under Vasiliki Papatseva. Yeah, Vasiliki Papatseva, who's a, a good colleague of mine, um, is fulsome in praise of your work uh, in the doctoral, at the doctoral stage. Your research interests include disciplinary identities and practices in teaching and research, sociology and politics of academic knowledge, again, a knowledge related focus, uh, widening participation, the research teaching relationship, curriculum theory, interrelations between student agency, belonging, and well being, and the impact agenda, which we'll discuss today in research and critical realism and social science, which many of us, I think, are much persuaded by and, 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 and engaged in as well. Look forward to your presentation, Alil, and the uh, screen is now yours. Thanks so much, Simon, and thanks, um, CG, for inviting me. I think um, for all of us, these webinars have been a really big part of our kind of scholarly life during the pandemic. So it's really a pleasure to speak to CG community today. Um, I will share my screen. Good, that is working. Okay, thank you, that's good to know. Um, so I will uh, come on to this um, boundaries metaphor in due course, um, but first I'm just going to uh, discuss this, what I mean by the impact agenda. Um, so I've got a couple of screen grabs here um, from the uh, Research Excellence Framework, which for me is um, one of the most uh, um, important examples and instantiations and institutionalizations of what we call the impact agenda. Um, so the impact agenda refers to this kind of a set of discourses and policies around the idea that universities and academics should um, increasingly think about the wide impact of their work outside academia and not just think about it, but actually be able to demonstrate it as well. And in the UK, um, there's a few examples of this. And as I said, probably the most uh, significant one is how it's um, become part of this research excellence framework. And I've got a couple of screen grabs to introduce what that is. So um, from the REF 2021, Research Excellence Framework 2021, it explains that the REF is the UK system 
for assessing the quality of research in UK higher education institutions, first taking place in 2014 and next one taking place this year, so currently underway in 21. Um, and a screen grab from 2014, just to kind of give a sense of the scale of the REF. Um, it assessed 154 universities and that's 1,911 submissions. My understanding is that submissions are from a department, so that's 1,911 departments. And it is kind of makes sense to say the first ref was 2014, but actually it has a kind of prehistory as well, um, because there were previous similar assessments going back to the 1980s, which took place every few years in the UK. But what was um, distinct and so new and different about the first ref in 2014 was this introduction of the um, criterion of impact where impact was defined in the quote below as an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment, quality of life beyond academia. And these were um, evidenced by those just under 7,000 impact case studies. So the 1900 departments submitted a few case studies depending on the size of their institution of the department they submitted a few case studies which they thought would best showcase the impact of their work beyond academia. Um, so I said that uh, this REF had a prehistory and I think so too does this discourse around impact. Um, there's a few ways I think you could look back on what that um, prehistory of impact is. Uh, I've chosen to do it in this particular way um, these are three reports from um, three relatively recent decades from one from the 80s, one from the 90s and one from the 2000s. Um, I'm just going, to, just going to pull out a, a couple of quotes from each of them. To, uh, yeah, to present some of this, this background and where I think one of the places where I think the impact agenda came from. So the first report, the Jarrett report in 1985, um, commissioned by the Committee of Vice Chancellors and Principals. Um, this report recommended bringing planning, resource allocation and accountability together into one corporate process, recognising the vice chancellor not only as academic leader, but also as chief executive of the university. And then 12 years later, um, this uh, Deering report for the government <coughs> uh, argued that higher education has benefited greatly from the leadership of its vice chancellors and principals and that their long-term vision is one of autonomous institutions taking increasing responsibility for determining their own futures. So that, that second part of the quote is a kind of general claim throughout the report, but I think this particular paragraph was talking about um, conditions and salaries of its staff. And then in the early 2000s, the Lambert Review of Business University Collaboration um, noted that business is critical of the slow moving bureaucratic risk averse style of university management, but there have been changes for the better in recent years with universities de delegating authority out of committees and into the hands of managers. Um, so a kind of hierarchy of, of management and administration, appointing professional staff often from the private sector and other universities should follow this lead. And um, the reason I chose this way to give the kind of background context to this idea of that academics should have impact and not just the idea that they should have impact but that this should be encouraged through a system like the REF which um, attaches monetary value to their performance on, on impact is, is that I see this as part of a trajectory where there's kind of increasingly external demands upon universities and that universities are expected to really respond to and engage with these external demands for example from industry from government but that through the documents like these, this is um, taking place kind of through a discourse of, um, well, so, sorry. So these, uh, this external demands upon universities could be implied to suggest that a kind of impingement upon academic autonomy or um, external powers driving what universities should, should be and what they should do, but this is, coming through a discourse of actually universities having more autonomy than ever, um, more autonomy and freedom to manage themselves as they choose. Um, and so 
I think when we are making statements such as in those kind of documents about um, statements such as the university is increasingly autonomous, the university is increasingly free to act as it chooses, um, I think we are right to ask questions such as what do we mean by autonomy and freedom, as Sue Wright does, and uh, I think Jana Bajovic goes even further and says in that kind of statement, what do we mean even by the university? Um, I've deliberately put these two papers together on one slide because I think they're, they're uh, interesting to read and, and consider in parallel. And what I take from reading them is that um, the power to define and make claims about and enact and set limits on freedom, on academic freedom, and also questions about who and what and where is the agency of universities. These are precisely what is at stake um, when we start to question uh, you know, who is driving these policies such as impact and the um, policies around the uh, increasingly centralization of, of authority within institutions, within universities, who's driving these changes and why? And I think these are the kind of things that are at stake. Um, for example, this policy of impact, who can we say that this, who's an agency is being enacted when we create this kind of policy? Is it the agency of um, academics? Is it governments? Is it academic managers? And this, again, this policy of impact, does it promote academic freedom or does it impinge on academic freedom? Some would say the latter, that it's um, a kind of uh, inappropriate steering of academic work. Uh, others would say it promotes freedom because it promotes and rewards new kinds of activities that previously they may not have had any um, re rewards from, even though maybe it was the kind of thing that academics wanted to do, but couldn't. Um, as I said, there's interesting parallels between these two papers, and one of them is that they both empirically explore boundary controversies. Um, for example, instances where academics have challenged perceived impingements upon academic freedom, um, or perhaps academics have, have done things or said things which have um, made them end up in debates and disputes with their employers about what the limits of academic freedom and academic boundaries are, uh, and in which the academic management would, um, they would make their announcements and assert their claims about what the boundaries are, what the limits are to what academics can do, what they can say, for example. And so in, in some sense, these papers are quite depressing read, but I want to take some kind of positives or take some heart from them. Um, they demonstrate that boundaries depend upon agency and for the most part, you know, maybe we could say that the powers that be of university management and governments have had significant um, ability to assert their agency on drawing academic boundaries. But at least in theory, it suggests that there are other actors including individual academics, um, can kind of unite to assert their agency and redraw boundaries as they see fit. And there's also some examples in, in those papers of what Wright calls livable, livable interspecies collaboration. And it's worth having a look at that paper to kind of see what she means in more detail because it's set in the kind of ecological um, metaphors, which I think are very interesting. And these are, this is kind of what I have been interested in in my research. How is it that, um, how can academics engage in uh, boundary crossing? Because I think it's inevitable that um, the work of an academic and the work of universities does engage in confronting and crossing academic boundaries. But how can boundaries be confronted and crossed in such a way that it doesn't undermine academic boundaries? And ideally, how can it be done in such a way that actually promotes or reinforces academic boundaries so that it's kind of a positive outcome for, for everyone concerned? Um, now, the main theorist who I relied on in my work was the sociologist Basil Bernstein. Um, so I'll just give some background, not um, in uh, too much detail, but just enough to give an insight into how I use his work. Um, for Bernstein, boundaries are grounded in power. So making a similar point to in the slide above, but boundary, uh, Bernstein goes a bit further and argues that actually power, uh, one of the main ways that power is created and asserted is actually through 
the construction of boundaries so power always operates to produce these dislocations in social space um and i like this quote just making what i think is a similar point that all universities need a and all institutions need some boundary creating self-conception but also key for Bernstein is that boundaries are never absolute um, and again I found this nice quote from an old OECD report um, which says even the ivory tower must be understood in terms of interaction not an illusory independence so you know even in its most kind of strongly bounded form the most the this ivory tower image of the university even that kind of university does actually have to depend on societal relations because at the very least it depends on um, certain segments of society seeing the ivory tower as a valuable institution which is worth supporting even if it even if it's relatively aloof from society in an everyday sense so um so bernstein kind of categorizes boundaries as devices for regulating relations um relations are always there they're always necessary so it's not about um can boundaries avoid all external relations because that's that's not practical and it, and it um and not desirable but uh, about regulating or again in his words controlling relations so bernstein has this concept of power um as closely related to boundaries he also has this concept of control which for bernstein means um refers to the forms that these relations across boundaries take um, and we could talk about a kind of continuum of relatively high and low control forms of um, forms that these relation takes uh, so for example at a kind of symbolic level i've already talked about the ivory tower which is a kind of high control approach um, we could also at another end of the spectrum talk about the entrepreneurial university which is kind of a, signposting or signaling to society you know we're going to be responsive um, to your needs um, we could also talk about graduates um, and our students as kind of relations because graduates take something from their academic experience out into the world and so we can look at okay do they bring with them a discipline-based curriculum or a more skills-based curriculum um, and in terms of the research side we could talk we could look at our research outputs predominantly technical and esoteric and very specialist or are they sometimes the more um, targeting lay or popular audiences or users so i think high and low control approaches could be seen as different approaches at regulating relations um, with different risks associated with that so um, you know some of these high control approaches um, they might do a very good job of maintaining control over relations, but there's a risk of losing relevance and perhaps losing legitimacy amongst wider society. Um, on the other hand, if you, um, a kind of low control approach could risk losing the institution's distinctiveness and their unique identity. Um, so, you know, my, my point being that relations are necessary and it's about how universities approach trying to regulate those relations and kind of take ownership over them such that they um, are hopefully positive in terms of re reinforcing boundaries instead of undermining them um, but again without kind of attempting to close them up too much which is just counterproductive uh, and so i actually introduced this concept of boundary transactions um not necessarily distinct from just bernstein's idea of relations but trying to just um Added a slight nuance to it, which is suggesting that they should offer something to wider society. These relations should offer something to wider society, but they should also offer something to the university. So these transactions might benefit wider society, um, but ideally they also advance academic missions or they enact academic values and identity rather than undermining them or going against them. So it's about demonstrating, it's about universities attempting to demonstrate what is distinctive about their activities, their work, their identity, but also what is distinctively valuable um, about what they do for wider society. Um, and so my study has been to try and look at boundary transactions in this context of the impact agenda that I talked about earlier. Um, and so that has meant I have selected um, research examples of research 
that um, the kind of research that is being privileged and prioritized and promoted in the context of the impact agenda. So my approach to sampling was first of all to, to select 10 departments that had achieved high ratings on the impact element of the REF. Um, for those who know about how the REF actually works, that means departments which achieved 100% three to four star ratings. I won't go into the mechanics of that because it's a bit um, fiddly. But yeah, for those who don't know about the REF, that just means they did well in the impact element of the REF. I chose to look at STEM only, um, so science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine disciplines, because I was interested in capturing, uh, seeing if I could capture some nuances around the differences between similar types of disciplines. Um, but within STEM, I did capture a range of disciplines. So each department was from a different discipline. And um, some other variations as well I wanted to capture. Um, it was quite difficult to get a full balance in terms of newer and older institutions. Um, so I've got seven departments were based in pre-92 universities or, or old universities and three from post-92 universities. I also, sorry, I didn't mention here, but I've also did include de departments from all four UK nations. Um, the study was mainly documentary. So I looked at 26 impact case studies. I'm gonna show you an example of the, what impact case studies look like in the next slide. Um, when I looked at the impact case studies that these departments had produced, uh, I realized that some of them were from the same, were, were, sometimes there was more than one impact case study came from the same kind of underlying project. So um, there's 19 pro kind of programs of research that I looked at underpinning these case studies. Um, the main data set for me was actually the research output. So I actually read all the, a lot of research outputs related to these 19 pro projects. Um, a bunch of other documents associated with the REF submission as well to help kind of contextualize the department and that context. And also then a lot of other web pages and kind of any other websites or reports I could find about the research or the people who conducted it or collaborated on it. And I supplemented that with 10 interviews. Um, I did try to interview someone from each project, but in the end I couldn't manage to um, persuade uh, or recruit enough people. Um, so I interviewed 10 people in the end, but they, some of them again had worked on more than one project. So they cover 14 of the 19 programs of research that I've looked at. Um, and as I said, so here's an example of just some screen grabs of what an impact case study looks like if you've never seen one before. There's five, they normally, they're um, four, four pages long and they um, have these five sections, summary of the impact, kind of summary of the underpinning research, references to the research, and then some more details about the impact and, and evidence to corroborate it. Um, so I've just chosen an example from uh, someone at my, the, the department I was at during my PhD. So as I said, I was interested in this idea of boundary transactions and um, the forms that they take. And in my study, I identified and uh, kind of distinguish between five forms of boundary transaction. Um, I, I think there's some blurring between these and overlaps between these and also other ways you could uh, break them down. So if it was a bigger study, I might have identified um, different types or broken them down in different ways. But um, these are the main ones I identified. So the first one, um, the most frequent one um, in my sample was boundary structures. So things like, um, structures which try to uh, sit between the university and wider society. Um, boundary spanning, so that's anyone kind of amongst students or graduates or staff who move between academic and non-academic contexts. Outreach, is, I've defined here as kind of participation in networks with potential users or sponsors, beneficiaries. Um, collaboration, I've defined here in terms of, um, I've distinguished collaboration from other transactions in terms of do they actually engage in co-producing the research with non-academics. Um, and then user-focused outputs. So this really depends on the audience. Um, I think really any output could or could not be considered a boundary transaction depending on how it's written, how it's presented and who the target audience is. Um, so this, I, I consider this quite exploratory research in the sense that it's a small sample. It's not about necessarily uh, generalizing from what I find here, but about exploring this concept of boundary transaction in practice and seeing how it works and what we can learn from it. 
Um, so I'm just going to give some examples, really, of, of what I found these um, boundary transactions doing. Um, so the first one is an example of a boundary structure. So I identified industry consortia in two different departments. Um, what I mean by this is where industry, uh, where businesses will pay a membership fee to participate in setting the research agendas of departments or, or particular units. And there's a couple of examples here, and they give an interesting um, distinction between how the same boundary structure can operate as a kind of lower or higher control um, approach. Um, because there's very lot of similarities. The first one was in chemistry, more kind of chemical engineering. The other one was in um, engineering, um, both in a similar industry, private sector utilities, both, as I said, have industry consortium, but there were some differences um, where in one case, recruitment was very, very long process, took a long time and a lot of effort to recruit industry members. And in the end, they, um, I would argue, ceded control by appointing an industry scientist as a professor of the university, somebody who had always been in industry, appointed them as professor in the department and co-director of this consortium to leverage their networks and recruit members. Whereas in the other example, they, these, these are quotes here from the person I spoke to who explained the companies were eager to join and their approach was, um, you know, they, they took a lot of control and ownership over the consortium and said, really, the onus is on you to come to us. We're going to do what we're going to do. And we think you'll probably want to be in on it. So, um, that's, so that's an example of uh, boundary structures. An example of boundary spanning that I identified um, in also in the one of the chemistry uh, projects that I looked at. Um, just some background. So the departmental impact of this was um, production of pharmaceutical um, processes rather than products. It, it, was, it was an approach to developing pharmaceutical products. And the health, the impact claimed was around financial returns from that kind of work and the health benefits. Um, now the impact itself was realized largely through um, not so much just the actual processes that were developed, but actually the impact was realized through doctoral graduates moving from the research center to a specific research group in the, in the company. And as that diagram demonstrates, actually at one point, at the point that the um, impact case study was submitted, half of this research group was um, staffed by people who had graduated as a doctorate from one specific research center where these processes were developed. And I think this is a good example of um, what we might mean by boundary transactions. Having this kind of regulation role or um, in the sense that this kind of boundary transaction doesn't just benefit the company, it doesn't just lead to potential impact claims, but actually it's also um, advancing the chemistry department's core missions as well. They're helping to train this, they're, they're training their students, they're providing them um, with increased employability, and they're also obviously at the same time advancing their research. Um, example of outreach here, um, and I think this is one which is a bit more kind of debatable and contested, about um, whether it's it's uh, managing to regulate and hold on to control over the processes. Um, it's the context is a computer science department, and the impact was actually on kind of health monitoring and benchmarking outcomes, and also some financial return, as we'll see. Um, this research center itself, where this took place, is very much a boundary structure. It positions itself as linking computer scientists and health experts, and um, one of, one of its aims was to produce a system for health monitoring and benchmarking um, patient outcomes, and, and especially surgery outcomes, um, and wanting to implement this across a whole health system if possible. And one of the big things they needed to do was um, outreach, was a really significant, was basically networking, was a really significant part of the work that had to go into it, and two very different types of networking. On the one hand, um, networking with professional bodies to try and promote uptake of their um, system in hospitals, um, but also venture capitalists to digitize and commercialize this monitoring system. Um, so it became a profit-seeking venture as well. 
Um, So I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the, um, so th th there's just a few examples of boundary transactions that I came across and how I identified and started to analyze them. Um, trying to get slightly closer to potential conclusions, um, I also looked across uh, a kind of general level of um, the boundary transactions I found um, and looking at them as potential indicators of effectiveness um, of transactions. That is, do they effectively regulate um, the boundaries in the sense I discussed earlier? Um, one of the things I did when looking at the projects was um, look at the differences as they developed dynamically from the early, middle and later stages of the project. And um, these, this uh, chart looks at um, collaboration as one transaction and looks at a different transaction as well, user-focused outputs. Um, the main thing I want to highlight in this is that actually you see the frequency of these types of transaction are similar at the early, middle and latter stages. Um, to me, this suggests that, sorry, but I missed half a sentence there. This suggests that these kind of transactions, I think it might be assumed that academics start to collaborate with non-academics or start to think about the needs of non-academics only towards the end of a research project. Um, suggesting it's maybe a kind of add-on. What I'm arguing here is that the prevalence of these um, transactions early on in the process as well suggests that actually transactions, if they're done in the right way, can be um, contribute to the kind of fundamental um, research goals um, in these projects. So they're not just add-ons, they're not just um, late-stage transactions which are only focused on impact. They're actually central to the research itself. Um, another way of thinking about are these transactions on a whole um, suggesting that they are effective forms of regulating boundaries is to think about the actual functions that these transactions play. So um, I'm talking about three transactions in this chart, um, boundary structures, boundary spanners and uh, outreach and asking, you know, did these forms of transaction only perform one function, i.e. have the impact function, or did they also simultaneously contribute to other um, of universities' core missions, for example, research um, or teaching? And uh, what it shows is that in a lot of these cases, probably the majority of these cases overall, um, these boundary transactions were not, again, just about impact. They were actually transactions which um, were part of the underpinning research itself. So by transacting, by engaging with non-academic um, actors, they were able to advance their own research as well as advancing interests of these external actors. Um, and as you can see, different boundary transactions were able to do that to different extents. So it kind of suggests to me that they are, the academics are able to retain control over the transactions. They're not just um, kind of being forced to interact, but they're actually doing it partly for their own benefit as well. Um, again, kind of going down this line of exploring potential conclusions we might start to draw from this line of analysis is um, looking at how these things vary by the departments that I studied. Um, I, uh, I tried to identify different kind of levels of prestige amongst departments. It's not easily done, um, you know, it's, it's a contested thing to look at, but I looked at not just um, the prestige of their institution, but also how highly a department had been ranked in other things, including the REF. Um, and one of the things I found that departments which seemed to have indicators of being more kind of prestigious or more elite um, did actually have quite a big difference in some of the boundary transactions that they engaged with. And as you can see here, they were far less um, likely to collaborate it, so they were um, less likely to engage in this particular form of boundary transaction of co-producing knowledge, which may suggest to me they take more ownership over their knowledge production than others. And instead they prefer to transact via their outputs um, and what those outputs are targeted to do and who they're targeted at. Um, so yeah, quite a, 
early stage conclusion and not really enough data to say it firmly, but this kind of analysis may indicate that certain departments have a greater capacity to control and regulate their boundaries. Um, and, and another um, bit of variation here, this time by branch of science. Um, what I've looked at is how often were the external collaborators um, themselves scientists or were they actually people without academic backgrounds? For the most part, all of the external collaborators in the studies that I looked at were themselves doctoral graduates. Um, and this was, particularly, this was particularly the case in formal sciences. So for example, computer science and maths and engineering, and far less so in the life sciences like biology and environmental science. Um, and this did seem to have an effect. Uh, I've called it low cost transactions. Or, or again, we could maybe say that um, in formal science, they were somehow better able to control their transactions and were less, um, found it less necessary to go outside their comfort zones, if you like. Um, so here's a quote from one of the people I spoke to, um, explained that most, if not all of the particular group we worked with had PhDs, so they would understand the university and the mode of operation. Um, another person I spoke to from the formal sciences, I think the challenges of working with industry are manageable. I don't find any issues. Um, I simply didn't get that kind of quote when I was speaking to people in the life sciences that I don't have quotes prepared here, but it was all about challenges with engaging with disparate types of people from all different types of backgrounds. Um, so uh, kind of summary rather than conclusions, because I think conclusions would require um, ex expanding this data set really. Um, but from what I've seen in the studies I looked at, Academia does and often can control um, its boundary transactions. And in that sense, seems to be able to regulate its boundaries through the research um, that they conduct. Um, but even symbiotic relations may advance interests unequally. One of the things um, that I found was that these boundary transactions, especially in the formal sciences where you're talking about people who, uh, external people are full of uh, themselves doctoral um, graduates. Um, these boundary transactions are with governmental bodies, large industry, and therefore it does um, raise the question of, okay, what about, uh, I think especially what about the kind of research that doesn't get valued and promoted in the context of the REF? Um, I think there's definitely obviously a kind of selection effect whereby I've, my findings have been influenced by how I sampled, obviously. Um, and so it raises questions about um, which, act, which external power, actors have power to collaborate with universities and to receive and engage in transactions with universities. And as I, as I showed in the last few slides, there's evidence that some departments tend to have to cede greater control over their research and their transactions. And um, as I said, some of these, um, seem to reinforce sector hierarchies in the sense that they, they map onto um, different kind of indicators of prestige of department. Um, and okay, I didn't actually go into this as much as I thought I might, but um, I did a little bit talk about the role of PhD students in this. And this is another issue which I think has emerged, which is um, that as the impact agenda becomes more um, essential to the work of academia, um, it actually starts to put that onto your students themselves um, because students are not the, no longer just there to be taught or made employable, but actually to contribute to academia's um, impact assessment. Um, so I think that's just a repeat. I will stop there and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Lil. And how interesting this terrain really is, you know, because it's about such a substantial uh, connection between universities and research and the rest of the world. And, you know, the intellectual problem of, of tracing how knowledge, you know, connects to everything else, how discourse, uh, relational discourse in academic world connects to other human activity. I mean, it's a tremendously challenging 
problem um, conceptually, theoretically, uh, and, and certainly in terms of empirical research. And yet, you know, along comes the impact agenda and quite rightly says we should be concerned about the relationships between science research and the rest of society and the economy and, and develops a set of observational techniques for pinning that down and quantifying it quite remarkable, you know, cutting across all of the difficulties that are entailed in the theoretical and empirical problem. And so I've naturally, of course, you know, hard to get it entirely right uh, uh, this way. I mean, the things that always, you know, jump out for me are, you know, the, the, you know, the problem of collective versus individual character of knowledge related work. I mean, um, you know, that, that all of us who create something that might be useful have, have done so only because we've built on the base of a, a whole lot of other work. And usually we're coming out of not just one research group, but a group of related research groups that are all kind of thinking together and feeding off each other. You know, so the idea that one, that one group or one person has an impact is sort of fairly, weird. well, it's questionable. You know, uh, it's, it's very hard to say where the boundaries are there. Uh, between one person's work and another. Another problem that's always struck me about this is, is how indirect, you know, a lot of it is, you know, the effects of knowledge and new ideas and new discoveries and so on, how indirect the impacts are really, you know, the, the, they're mediated by many other factors. They often go through several stages. There's often long time lags before knowledge becomes relevant in practical ways, like creating new products and so on. So, Again, you get one process, you know, which, which, which is sort of temporarily, um, in temporal terms, quite, um, I suppose, monocultural. You know, it doesn't really capture these different variations in terms of lags and indirectness versus directness and so on. Um, but I think the biggest problem for me is the empirical problem. I mean, you know, we can say there are a lot of things where we in, in life where we can say in society where we can say there are causes and effects, but we can't easily observe them we can't easily observe them in a comprehensive way that sort of captures everything about the cause and effect relationship that's going on uh, and, and so we're reduced to these kind of proxy observations like you know the impact of, of of research on policy i mean what's the testimonial unless there's a unless there's a a piece of legislation where the minister got up and said we are pushing forward this piece of legislation because of research by doctors x and y um, unless that's actually there, uh, you're sort of reduced to making rather general claims, um, and 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 in the end, dependent on testimonial letters, you know, which are probably about as authentic as references are. You know, a grain of truth, but a lot of exaggeration goes on. So, you know, this is the, the sort of the empirical proxies are, are I reckon, pretty problematic for, in a lot of cases, and it's not because people are liars or they're making up stories about their research that aren't true. It's because it's really hard to demonstrate empirically. Um, so your thoughts on that, that, that scattered set of points before we go into the Q&A where, we, where we've already got um, uh, four substantial contributions coming through. My thoughts on that. Um, uh, I, think, I think my main thought is that for those very reasons, I didn't exactly try to set out to make claims about whether the impacts claimed were actually well substantiated. Um, so I think that's my main response, only that it is that complex and I wouldn't uh, try to argue that, yeah, whether those claims are substantiated. I did come across several instances, in fact, where that kind of um, link in legislation was there um, so that it, it did happen in a couple of cases that I looked at um, but yeah reading through these impact case studies and, and seeing the constructed narratives around these you know pathways to impact is, is the word people use um, was a really interesting exercise and what's also interesting is uh, other times when I presented this research I don't expect I'll get it today but other times I've presented this research has resulted in questions of uh, you know how do I write my impact case study which um, it's not my job. <laughs> Thanks, Alil. Let me bring in now a succession of questions. We've got, we'll take them one at a time until we start to run out of time and we'll start to bunch them at that point. But I've already got on the call list, Andrew Gibson, 
Ron Barnett, uh, Mike Klassen and David Mills. And so Andrew, you have the first call. Thanks very much, Simon. And thank you, Alil, for that. That was really interesting. Got a lot out of that. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask you, uh, you did STEM, you're looking at STEM, but if you were to look at humanities and social sciences, what would be the kind of things you would be looking out for? Or would there be anything you would change? The reason I'm asking that is because I'm thinking, you know, perhaps the way that you looked at and used boundaries from Bernstein, that very interesting way, would that work in the same way for the humanities and the social sciences, do you think? Um, I'm inclined to think it would. Um, so I think there would be some very different things. And I, I, I think, but I think that some of the findings might actually be quite likely to be the same when we look at, for example, um, I looked at some of the kind of, I, know, I noticed some of the differences between say the formal sciences and the kind of life sciences. So uh, I, I can imagine a similar finding mapping onto these kind of mathematical social sciences and those which, um, and social sciences or humanities which uh, engage with uh, people on a more uh, qualitative basis. I can see that kind of finding being quite similar. Um, for example, the boundary transactions of the formal sciences and social formal social sciences or mathematics, the kind of mathematical social sciences might lead them to interactions with um, other professionals with a very similar skill set to them. For example, in I'm thinking maybe think tanks or people in government. Um, whereas I can imagine in the more qualitative social sciences, some of the transactions might involve uh, collaborating with um, different types of professionals, let's say, I don't know, for example, social care workers or um, uh, you know, people, maybe people in the community. Um, there was some of that in what I, in my study, I, I didn't give every example, obviously, but there was some examples of um, direct community engagement, but um, you might expect to find more of that. So I think when, when you look at, when you talk about it in terms of certain parameters, yes, you might find some similar findings. Um, Maybe also in terms of differences when we talk about the prestige of the institution, again, that might be something where there's a difference between, um, you know, or research intensive and more teaching intensive institutions. I can imagine a similar kind of finding um, emerging there. In terms of the actual content and the processes, um, yeah, I'm sure they'd be very different. But I think, just going back to what I said earlier, sometimes I was quite surprised um, at how in depth and almost qualitative some of the work was that I was coming across in this in the stem stuff but yeah of course it would be different um it would be interesting to look at thank you our second question is from Ron Ron Barnett hey well that was tremendous if I can say so I thought it was uh, absolutely fascinating and a very strong theorization brought together with empirical work so uh, it's tremendous um, uh, uh, piece of work you're doing there. I, I I was struck first of all by your definition, the definition that you offered us right at the start of impact, and given that as a context to what my question is, I want to ask you this: uh, Do you have any recommendations for those who are working in the field of research into higher education? Because your, in, your, your definition that you started with set up a very strong boundary between higher education on the one hand and the world on the other. And it said that impact was only going to concern, as it were, the world outside of higher education. But you had an example of impact drawn from your Sheffield, the Sheffield study on higher education and further education. So I'm wondering how this, how your, your, your theorization and your categories of boundaries and transactions and so forth uh, can play out so far as research into higher education is concerned. Yeah, I think that's a really, um, thank you firstly so much for your really kind words, Ron, thank you. Um, but yes, uh, the question, I, I think, um, so in, in that case, uh, for example, in uh, the Sheffield case, which was um, 
the kind of main researcher on that was Gareth Parry, who is obviously associated with CG as well. Um, so that that was permitted because the effect, the the impact was on policy. It was the so the, the impact was claimed to be on um, national governments, governments and local governments policy, which yes happens to be on university. So in in that sense, you it, it's it's possible in that sense. Um, and if if you look at some of the education, um, you know, not just higher education, but actually education as a field. Um, yeah, there were some examples of impact. Obviously, I didn't look at education for this study, but I've looked at it in, in other work um, with my um, colleague and former supervisor Vasiliki. Um, yes, you have to be careful about what you claim if your impact is anything to do with pedagogy, because you can't talk about impact on your own students. Um, you would have to argue that um, your impact was across the sector more generally so that somehow there's a uh, there's an outside world called uh, pedagogical theory or pedagogic practice and you influence that which in turn influenced on the ground teaching in different universities so it's it's a bit tricky they did kind of allow for it within the context of that panel of assessors in the education department uh, education um, uh, rep assessment but it's I mean, I've got one, one of the people in my one of my participants um, straight off the bat said, you know, it's an odd and iniquitous detail that you can't include impact on your students as impact because, you know, he is a research professor was also passionate about teaching and thought that that's the biggest impact he has was on teaching. Um, and I think it is something which has been considered to be looked at in future rounds of the ref. Um, but I, I guess if I have advice, it would be to be careful and strategic about how you word it. Um, and yeah, so I also I, I did include in one of the slides that example of um, how one chemistry department um, worded it, which was, or how they framed it, which was, yes, our teaching has, um, uh, we, we've taught, we've trained our PhD students in this particular method that we've developed. Um, and that in itself wouldn't count as impact that you know they wouldn't care you've taught your students something really important it's not until they go out and then apply what they've taught and generate money from it then you can claim it as impact so uh yeah i think you've hit on a really important and as one of my participants would say iniquitous detail of um of, of the uh, of the process thank you yeah, I mean, I think that the, the major impact of any kind of knowledge, new knowledge is on people, you know, it's on their mentality, on their ideas, what mm -hmm. they can then do for the rest of their lives. But that knowledge is the impact. And of course, that we can't pin down. But in a rather empiricist way, we people have to practice something before we can say that it's affected them or, or not. Uh, and next question, one I would have liked to have asked myself, I think, is uh, if, I, if I thought of it as well as Mike Plasson has, is from Mike. Mike, come in, please. Yeah, um, thanks so much. Really thrilling presentation. And, and also your book on this topic is, I know, goes into these things in more detail. Um, given that you're drawing on, on Bernstein, my question was, I was curious whether you found Bernstein's notion of singulars and regions um, as a kind of useful way of theorizing what you're seeing. And, you know, I raise it because one of the key ways he distinguishes singulars as the classic disciplines, regions as the professions in really loose terms is in terms of how strong the boundaries are and what that means for kind of distinctive identities, relationships to practice, et cetera. Um, you know, I love your study design having these different, I guess, fields or disciplines, depending. Um, did you, do you find those categories of singulars and regions helpful or useful in your analysis? And, you know, often we use the word STEM as a catch-all, but, you know, I think that one of the ways that the S, T, E, and M are quite different is is the the type of discipline or field they are so did you see differences between for example the engineering and and some of the science uh fields in terms of those you know boundary uh strength of boundaries thanks so much thank you yeah um and thanks for plugging the book as well um so uh i chose not to um include uh, and, and even even in the thesis, which is obviously you know the, the longer piece of work because this is based on my doctoral research, um, I didn't really go into those particular that particular terminology of Bernstein regions and singulars um, and um, 
just for people who uh, are interested but don't necessarily know Bernstein's terminology, regions being um, uh, singular being kind of fund you know basic or fundamental disciplines like um, maths or or physics, and then regions being more kind of practitioner oriented ones like medicine and engineering. Um, the reason I didn't go into too much depth about that initially was because I think, especially because I was looking at research which had had an impact, uh, sorry, which had which had rate, been rated highly for impact, you're getting at a level of um, such self-selected research that, you know, it, it does kind of break down those boundaries. For example, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, the, the physics, for example, I looked at one physics department and that was more or less engineering. Um, and the chemistry research I looked at, again, was more or less engineering. Um, for, for, the, for, for a lot of the parts. So it's um, it was kind of hard to sustain that if I did bring those concepts in. Um, it would probably work if you did a bigger study and you hadn't selected it in that sampling way that I did. You, you'd probably find more. But I did look at um, some variation in terms of how applied and basic the research, um, the kind of core discipline that, you know, the the home discipline was, even if the work, work didn't really fit those categories. Um, and the answer is I did find some um, difference, but it was a bit more slight and nuanced, which is why I didn't include it in this presentation. But um, one of the um, main things I found was that, yeah, in, in, in disciplines which were kind of more basic or, or singulars, yes, there was a bit more, I, I think, of those transactions were more likely to be, um, I, I said that a lot of the transactions were also engaged in not just the impact, but also the fundamental research. I would say there was slightly more of that in these singulars compared to in the regions or the more applied disciplines. So there was a bit of that. Um, I think what was more interesting was these disciplines in the middle, such as um, like environmental science or, or um, Earth sciences, which are kind of in the middle between basic applied, some of those um, were actually the most distinctive, and and in some ways they were actually some of the more they they acted more like singulars than the so-called basic disciplines in my study. And yeah, that that takes some detailing and evidence. So maybe we can talk afterwards. But yeah, that was what I found. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually glad you've loosened up those categories a bit. I really like Bernstein, but I always found those a little bit abrupt and those cutoff points. Um, David, David Mills, please. Great, Elia, that was fascinating. I'm going to be a bit um, um, predictable, probably, and, and ask the Durkheim question because, of course, Bernstein was, was you know, and it's great to see you sort of reinvigorating uh, the canon, so to speak, in within sociology of education. But Bernstein, you know, is caught in the same problem as the Durkheim had, which is how you theorize social change. And, and so I wonder whether you wanted to reflect on that in terms of what you've done, because clearly departments do rise and fall, you know, and universities rise and fall, they, they are able to trade, you know, there is a sort of credibility cycle or an investment cycle that, 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 that goes on where you can possibly at some points collaborate more and then other points sort of less, depending on your prestige. I, I wondered, you know, if you'd be able to give any clues about that, because sort of your analysis sort of, sort of suggests that existing hierarchies are being reinforced. But, but, but could you find examples of where they were being challenged or, or reworked? Yeah, so I, I mean, I totally agree. And I think, I think at times Bernstein even you know, acknowledges that himself. Um, he does write quite um, uh, aloof, with some aloofness sometimes, but I think he does acknowledge, you know, he, does, he does talk about the limitations of the boundary metaphor and, and you're absolutely right. Um, I, th I think, for me, I've, um, I personally think this, uh, when we read people like Durkheim and Bernstein, yeah, we do have to assume that, that change comes from somewhere else, so it comes from somewhere else. And I think one of the papers I referenced in there um, by Bashkovich, actually, she, she uses this assemblage theory, which I think is maybe slightly better at dealing with that. Um, but it's not really my, I don't know, I'm not too read up on it, but I would, I would, I would um, recommend looking at that paper. Um, but did I find examples of it? It's, it's, it's kind of hard to say because in some ways you could say that all the examples of um, that I captured were potentially of that because these were all, again, these were all examples of research which had already done well in the impact assessment. Um, 
I would say that these kinds of policies do offer opportunities. They do offer um, kind of disruptions. And that's, that's the word used in um, the Sue Wright's paper that I um, cited. She does talk about disruptions. And I think in theory, this kind of new policy, this new criterion for kind of distinction and assessment can be a disruption to these hierarchies. And I think that's just what's, so, what's just so fascinating is, is how rarely it is the case. So yeah, I, I, I guess uh, that's, that's the challenge. Yes, of course, we, yeah, we do see change happening, but it's, it's so slow and sometimes it doesn't come with the policies that you expect it to or, or that, that are marked as, um, as bringing change. Great, thank you, that's interesting. C. Sanger, please. Yes, um, Elio, there's something that's still puzzling me here, which is, I think at the moment, surely we're talking about claims to impact. Whereas, as with your student example, impact can surely only be evaluated retrospectively. And I think here we begin to get into that more political context that I, I suspect David Mills was just about, was you know, beginning to take us into. Uh, it's something it's just quite simply puzzling me at the moment. So I'd like your just your thoughts on that. Um. So yeah. So I I I suppose I I suppose I would just agree, um, and and understand. Maybe I would say I'm just as puzzled because I think I agree that the actual the the whole the whole world of the impact assessment in the ref. Yes, it's based on claims to impact, and and I think as Simon discussed earlier, it's very difficult to really substantiate some of the claims. Um, and I suppose, so if I was to, um, if, if you're asking me that as a question that I should necessarily know the answer to, I would say, well, uh, I'll kind of step back and say, uh, I think I'm just as puzzled by the whole world of impact assessment and why, we, why it's done and how it's done as, um, as you are and say that I, didn't want to look into the question of are these claims substantiable? Are they are they well justified? And it was more okay. This is the kind of research which somehow is being promoted and privileged by the impact assessment process. And what can we learn by studying um, this research in detail? And maybe what does it mean for where the world of research is going? But yeah, whether they whether they whether they're worth anything more than just claims is mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's beginning to sound like a substantive question. Right. Um, I want to thank you, Lila. I think that was a really successful webinar from our point of view, you know, really substantial issues. And the, the way you've approached this theoretically, I think, has, has been really helpful. And uh, I mean, what I liked a lot from your presentation was the, um, the way in which you modelled the, you know, the relationship between universities and other players and um, you know the various devices you're you're developing around boundaries and so on uh, and that's I mean it's a very complex problem obviously this relational environment and to start to flesh it out in this met metaphorical form was very helpful where is your work on in this area going now what, what are your current inquiries um so I am in the process of writing up um some, some papers actually dealing with some of the questions I think issued today, particularly uh, bringing, um, I do want to write a paper responding basically to David Mill's question, which is um, critiquing some of this from that Durkheimian and uh, neo-Durkheimian kind of neo-functionalist perspective and exploring, um, you know, can we, can we somehow challenge and update that line of theorizing? Um, I'm actually, uh, I've been a postdoc at Imperial College for the last two and a half years. I'm doing something a bit different, but I'm actually moving to King's College uh, next month to do research on um, kind of cultures of impact um, amongst uh, academics and policymakers in the UK, US, and Australia, um, working with Jonathan Grant and Kate Williams. So that's mm -hmm. uh, the next um, line of research which is obviously kind of very closely related. So I hope there's opportunities to um, bring, in, bring in some of the same things I've been interested in, bring in some of the theories that I'm interested in to that project. So that's my first start to your exciting question. That sounds substantial and hopefully we'll bring you back into our webinar program with perhaps with your King's collaborators as well. 
Um, so we look forward to that. Thank you again, colleagues. Um, we're back again on Tuesday, uh, and our presenters are Yut Lu, who's from King's College London, and Wen Chin Chen from Peking U, and they're looking at how elite students in China coming through Peking U are using international credentials, Ivy League, Ultra Bridge credentials, to add another layer of distinction to their CVs. Uh, and how the whole industry has been built up around this uh, study abroad industry, um, which has now been cracked down upon and regulated differently in China. So, you know, what will happen to this elite track? Uh, how will the elite students and their families behave in the new, more regulated environment? So, interesting always to study elite behavior and elite activity in higher education because we do see it uh, in front of us. And um, we have two excellent presenters to help us with that topic. So it remains for me to say once again, Alil, thank you. And thank you all for your participation and your excellent questions and discussion. And bye for now.